I'm going to say something extremely controversial to start off the message. All right? You might not agree with this statement, and that's fine. The facts are still the facts, and even if you don't agree with it, you'll still be wrong. I have got the best mom in the entire world. Your mom is not as good as my mom. We can debate it, we can argue it, we can discuss it, but at the end of the day, you are still wrong because my mom is the best mom. As the kids like to say in this day, no cap. <laughs> now, for those of you guys who don't know what no cap means, don't worry, I don't either, so <laughs> I'm right there with you. In, in the hierarchy of people who have ever lived, there's Jesus, then there's Mother Teresa, then there's my mom right in between them. That's how awesome my mom is. I grew up in a single parent household and uh, there were a couple of us that lived in that house and my mom always instilled in us a love for God and a love for people. And it wasn't something that she just said, but it was something that she walked. She walked this experience out with us. We were the hub of the church. My house was the hub of the church. We had so many people over at our house it was chaos. My mom loved for so many people to be over at our house that she gave the keys to the house to almost everybody in the church. <laughs> you think I'm playing? There were some of those fat heads that were at my house when I got home from school. They were playing my video games and eating my Doritos. <laughs> I don't share Doritos. This body doesn't share food a whole lot, okay? But everybody was at our house. It was amazing to see. My mom opened up our house where we would allow people to come and stay with us if they were in hard times, if they had troubles, tri trials, tribulations. If there was something going on in their house, my mom opened the doors and said, hey, you come live with us. We had my aunt, my uncle. We had people that weren't even related to us living in our house. It was awesome. It was great. I loved it. It was amazing. But my mom also owned a minivan. Any minivans in the house? Daniel, my man. We owned a minivan not because the immediate family needed a minivan. We owned a minivan because of all the people that we took to church. Everybody got in our minivan. I don't know how we got so many people in our minivan. They were, it was like one of those clown cars where all these people just kept piling out and piling out and piling out. If we got pulled over, we were all getting arrested. It wasn't uncommon for my mom to stop and pick up uh, two, three, four people just to get them to church. There was something inside of her that said, if I'm going to make a difference in somebody's life, I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to give, I'm going to invest in other people. Right. And it's so cool living in such an amazing person's house. She gave us words of wisdom to live by. The first words of wisdom that she always told us was that to whom much is given, much is required. Here I am at 10 years old. I don't understand what that means. Like, what are you talking about, Mom? I got a lot of Halloween candy. Are you expecting me to share that with everybody? No, I didn't sign up for that. We're not playing that game. But her mindset was, if you are blessed by God, be a blessing to someone else. Give outside yourself and say, hey, God, you take it and you use it. The second thing that she always told her kids was to never have kids. <laughs> you think I'm playing? I ain't. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, I've got two amazing kids. I've got Jake Archer Legrand, who is 15, and Reagan Shea Legrand, who is 10, and they are amazing. They act just like me. They are awesome. I love them. But my mom always said, never have kids. And in 2007... My brother and his wife, they found out that they were pregnant. Then a month later, Candace and I found out that Candace was pregnant. Then six months later, my sister found out that she was pregnant. So in a matter of a year, my mom went from zero grandkids to three grandkids. <laughs> then my other sister, she said, okay, I see you guys all had one kid. I'm going to raise the ante. She decided to have twins. Are you kidding me? Twins. 
So now, my mom has so many grandkids, it's crazy. The house is always full with the grandkids, but she is an amazing grandma. In fact, in the hierarchy of people who have ever lived, there's Jesus, there's Mother Teresa, and then there's my mom as a grandma. She is awesome, but she just loves kids. She enjoys them being around. She enjoys them yelling and screaming and throwing stuff in the house. She loves it. The last thing my mom always told us as kids was to choose your friends wisely. I hated that. I thought that was the worst thing in the world. Why are you telling me to choose my friends wisely? It's not like I'm out there making friends with the devil. I'm trying to build a relationship with a young lady named Candace. Why are you telling me to choose my friends wisely? She understood that the people in your life could affect who you are, but also who you can become. They can affect the way you talk, the way you act, the way you react, the way you treat people, the way you love people, the way you love God, the way you build your relationships with people. You see, the people around you affect who you become. That's why here at Amarillo Fellowship, we want to encourage you to take your kids back to AF Kids. Because on Sunday morning, we want them to have a connection with God, but also a connection with other kids that are in the house of God. You see, as a parent, you have the ability to guide those relationships right now. So why don't you guide that relationship to be in the house of God? That's why we encourage you to bring your kids here on Wednesday night for youth night. Because your students, your youth, they need God. They need God relationships in their life. So that's why we encourage you to bring them here on Wednesday night. That's also why we encourage small groups here at Emerald Fellowship. Because you need God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need God. You see, there are times in your life whenever you're battling and you're fighting and the devil's all over you. And you need a godly person standing right next to you and say, hey, come on, buddy. You got it. We can make it together. When the enemy comes in like a flood, we need a friendship to say, hey, come on. We can make it together. You see, and Jesus understood this idea of a sphere of influence. When Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30, he picked out 12 disciples. And he said, I want these disciples to be around me so I can invest in the future of the kingdom of God. I want these men to see everything that I do. These disciples went everywhere with Jesus. They watched the way he acted, the way he talked, the way he treated people. They were there every step of the way. They were there when Jesus fed the multitude with five loaves and two fish. They were there when Jesus walked on water. They were there at the pool of Bethesda when Jesus healed that man and said, hey, come on, pick up your bed and walk with me. They were there when Jesus stood at the front of the boat and said, peace be still. And all the rain stopped and all the wind stopped and all the waves stopped. They were there when Jesus went into the temple and he flipped the tables and chased out the money changers. They were there. They were there every step of the way. And the reason why they were there is because Jesus understood that if we're going to change the world, there have got to be people around me that can take this ministry and blow it up. They can take it. They've got to see what I'm doing so I can start to invest in them. And as Jesus was crucified, he went and he met his disciples one last time, and the 11 were there. And in Mark chapter 16, Jesus is standing in front of his disciples and in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 18, he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that is believes and baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now watch this. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Everyone say follow. follow. These signs shall follow them that believe. Where am I at? Is that King James? That's not King James. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. Nope. <laughs> not believing that one, Jesus. They shall take up servant, serpent, servants, serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands. Watch this. They shall lay hands. No, you ain't hearing me. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover 
You see, this promise wasn't just to the disciples, but this promise was to the followers. Tap your neighbor and say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. This promise wasn't just to the minister. This promise wasn't just to the pastor. This promise wasn't just to the worship leader. But this promise was to every single one of us that ye shall lay hands on the sick and you're going to watch them recover. It's not a question. You're not standing there saying it might happen. No, what you stand up and you put your foot down and say you shall. And Jesus is still pulling for people to change their world. Jesus is still pulling for people to make a difference in their life. So today we are going to learn about a guy, uh, some followers who had the opportunity to change their world. I've asked Braxton to come on up and be a part of this lesson. I'm one of those that I need to see something before I can catch it. So everyone give it up for Mr. Braxton. In Mark chapter 10, we get this amazing story of a guy named Blind Bartimaeus. <laughs> so fancy. Looking good, but whoa, easy. Mm. Bible gives us a story of a gentleman named Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. And the Bible said that Jesus is walking through the town of Jericho. It doesn't talk a whole lot about what he's doing in Jericho, but the Bible does says that a great following is following Jesus around the town. The Bible said that all of a sudden, blind Bartimaeus is on the side of the road, and he's sitting there so beautifully. <laughs> you look so good. Now, I don't know when, where blind Bartimaeus was sitting, but... The Bible says that he was sitting on the side of the road. I'm assuming that blind Bartimaeus has been there before. That this is a spot where old Barney goes to. You see, he's comfortable in this place. He feels good in this place. He's been here before. He's, 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 he's excited. He feels comfortable sitting there because he's been there before. But the Bible says that a great multitude was following Jesus. And I can imagine as blind Bartimaeus is sitting there asking for money, that he starts to hear the footsteps as they're walking up to him. I can see as blind Bartimaeus starts to get a little excited because he knows that the payday is about to happen. I can see him as he claps his hands together and rubs them with anticipation. Man, he's good. <laughs> he knows that something's about to happen. I can imagine as the first person walks, walks past blind Bartimaeus and Barney looks at him and says, help. Thank you. He says, what's going on? There, there's so many people. It's crazy. I can hear all the noises. And Barney's looking around blindly. <laughs> With his hands out saying, man, I need something. I can imagine as the first person walks past Barney and Barney's saying, hey, what, what's going on? What's happening? What, what, what's, what's, what's all this noise and commotion about? I can imagine as the first person walks right past Barney and just ignores him. But that doesn't stop Barney from reaching out a little bit more. I can imagine as the next person walks by and Barney grabs him. Thank you. And he stops him. He says, hey, what's going on? I can imagine as that person says, hey, listen, it's, it's Jesus. Barney, all of a sudden, his demeanor changes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. His demeanor changes. His mindset changes. Inside, he's like, man, is this, is this the real Jesus? Is this the one that I heard about? Is this the one that spit in the ground and made mud and put it on a guy's eyes and healed him? Is this the guy that raised Lazarus from the dead? Is this the same Jesus? I can imagine his blind Bartimaeus starts to get a little excited as something starts to stir up inside of him. And more people start to walk by and all of a sudden the crowd starts to get a little bit closer. And blind Bartimaeus stands up. And there was something inside of him that says, if I can just get the attention of Jesus, my life can be changed forever. I can imagine his blind Bartimaeus was a little timid at the beginning and he just let out a little cry, Jesus. That was good. Thank you. 
don't look at me like that. <laughs> I am happily married. <laughs> I can imagine as the people were walking past old Barney, and Barney's like, okay, that, that, that was a little weak, but let me try it a little bit harder. Jesus, hey, hey, Jesus. And the Bible says that the followers of Christ, watch this, it was the followers of Christ who were standing by blind Bartimaeus and it was the followers that told him to sit down and be quiet. The definition of a Christian is a follower of Christ. This is what they did. They looked at old Barney and said, hey Barney, I've been following Jesus all day and he hasn't healed me. Why do you think he's going to heal you? Let me translate that. Hey, Barney, I've been coming to church all my life, and he hasn't healed me. Why do you think he's going to heal you? Who do you think you are? Why don't you just sit there and be quiet? I can imagine as the next person looked at Barney and said, Hey, listen, I gave money to the poor. I gave money to the temple, and he didn't heal me. Let me translate that. Barney, do you even pay your tithes? I can imagine as the next guy walks past, walks past Barney and looks at him, says, man, you're a little dirty. You got some dirt hanging off of you. When was the last time you had a bath? Let me translate that one. Hey, Barney, you got some sin hanging off of you. Have you even been baptized? Why are you trying to get the attention of Jesus? Why are you trying to get the one who can make a difference in your life? You don't even look the part. You don't look like us. You don't act like us. You don't talk like us. You don't walk like us. You don't, you don't worship like I worship. You don't read your Bible. You don't pay your tithes. You haven't been baptized. Why do you think God's going to do something in your life? Now, what would happen if the followers of Christ flipped the script on the story? What would happen if instead of looking at blind Bartimaeus and coming up with excuses of why he couldn't get healed, that they looked at him and said, hey, man, you got a problem. You got a need. You got a situation. But I know the one that can meet the need. And they grab blind Bartimaeus by the hand. And they say, follow me as I take you to Christ. You see, these signs shall follow them that believe. You got to lead them to Christ. You got to take them to the one who can make a difference. You got to take them to the one who can heal them. Come on, Barney, stick with me. You got to be the one that can make a difference in their life because they need you. Watch this. Hey, Barney, you got cancer? I know a God who can heal cancer. Hey, Barney, you got diabetes? I know a God that can heal diabetes. Follow me. Hey, Barney, you're a Dallas Cowboys fan? Yes. Bring the holy water. We need it. And these signs shall follow them that believe. It's time we take the people by the hand and say, let me lead you to Jesus. It's time we take them by the hand and say, I know the one that can make a way. I know the one that can deliver you. I know the one that can put your family back together. I know the one that can take away your depression, your anger, your bitterness. I know the God that can heal you. You see, and when we get them in the presence of God, the impossible becomes possible. There's such a sweet presence in here, such a sweet presence of God. If you're filled with the Spirit, if you can start praying softly, I'm coming to a close, and as we all stand, you see, I am so guilty of this in my life. I got people all around me who need Jesus. But I look at them and say, hey, not today, buddy. I'm a busy guy. I got stuff I got to do. I don't got time to lead you. I got people who got sickness in their life. And I say, hey, I know God can do it. But you look a little rough. 
and I make excuses of why I can't lead them to God. A lot of the times I think that God is finite, that he's limited in power. And if God heals you, how can God heal me? And I say, hey, not today. I'm sorry. But let me pump you full of faith for one more moment. Your God is not small. Your God is not weak. Your God is not anemic. Your God is not scared of your situation. Your God's not afraid of where you're at. Your God's not afraid of the diagnosis. Their God is bigger than your situation. Your God is bigger than the banker. Your God is bigger than everything that you're going through and everything that you're facing. Your God is bigger than that depression. Your God's bigger than the anger. Your God's bigger than everything that you're going through. Your God's bigger than that family fight. Your God's bigger than suicide. Your God's bigger. And today I'm standing in front of an amazing group of people. And I know you're battling. I know you're fighting. I know you're struggling. So why am I preaching this today? It's because there's people in the house that God wants to touch. I'm going to do something a little different. And please forgive me. If you need something from God, whether it's physical, emotional, financial or spiritual, will you please raise your hand? There's a lot of needs in the house, but I know a big God. I know a God who can do it. I know a God who can make a way when it seems like there's no way. This is what I'd like to do to close off the service, and we're going to bring up Pastor Richie here in one second. But if you've got someone next to you that has their hand raised, I want you to reach over there and pray for them. I want you to reach over there and say, God, you work on their life. You touch them. You anoint them. God, you bless them. God, right now we come with faith to move mountains. We come right now, God, believing that you're able and capable, God, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. You might have been struggling as you walked in, but God is saying, I'm going to bring life into your soul. You might have been battling the devil, but God is saying, I'm going to make a way. You might have been fighting a situation, and you're saying, I don't see any hope, but God said, I'm going to provide hope. You might have been in the situation where you're saying, God, I don't feel loved, and it feels like there's no love in my life, but God said, I'm going to give you love. God, we love you. We thank you. We invite you into this place, God. We invite you to move, God, to have your will and your way in this service, God. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In fact, would you mind just keeping your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a second? One of the things that, that I recognize, and Johnny, that was such a great word for us today, is that I have to acknowledge my need of God before he'll ever step into the moment with me. And there's so many times when, like blind Bartimaeus, people have, maybe we've gotten, people either have told us to be quiet or we feel like they're telling us to be quiet and we've just gotten quiet instead of getting desperate for God. And, and it really does take humility and a, and a humble heart to come to God and say, God, I need you. God, I, I, I need you to help me. Pastor, I need you to help me lead my family. I need you to help me with my finances. I need you to help me in my marriage. I need you to teach me how to raise kids because, man, it's a crazy world we live in anymore. It's that acknowledgement of needing God. And, and so, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would give us a heart to recognize our great need for you. Lord, not just when our world's falling apart, but Lord, in everyday life to acknowledge and recognize we need you. We don't want to start our day off without you. 